justification for genocide. None. I got mad. And when I got back to New York, we organized a demonstration in Times Square in November because the U.S. was about to drop bombs then. When this most recent crisis came up, we started organizing again. And we called for national days of demonstrations and along with our efforts and efforts from people all over the country who opposed this war, you saw how many demonstrations there were all over in the last month. Now we're calling for a national march on Saturday. We expect that there's going to be buses that are coming from Boston. They're already being arranged. Amherst, Pennsylvania, upstate New York, Washington. It's almost unprecedented that Washington is coming to New York, but they are because they know that this is going to be important. There's going to be buses coming from Virginia. This is what I know about so far. While I was in Iraq, one of the other things that I think a lot of people here know about that I just want to highlight is depleted uranium. Now, the U.S. used depleted uranium shell casings. This is a radioactive material that's extremely hard, so it can penetrate a tank. I saw a young girl about 14 years old in the hospital in Basra. She had leukemia. There's been a huge jump of leukemia, lymphoma, cancer, tumors, birth defects, miscarriages, not only in Iraq, in Kuwait, and some of the Gulf War veterans, their families are suffering from the exact same thing. Especially around Basra. Basra is right where that highway to death was, where the U.S. came in and strafed 60 miles of highway, a lot of it with depleted uranium weapons, destroying any vehicle in its wake, whether it was a civilian vehicle, whether it was a military vehicle, no matter what it was, fleeing people were destroyed. There is about 300 tons of depleted uranium all over the southern part of Iraq and Kuwait. This young girl, her mother helped her sit up. She's about 14. I took a picture of her. After we walked out of the ward, the, the, her mother ran after me. And she's like, can you send me that picture? And, and I said, sure, I'll try. And I thought about it after. I, 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 I've been thinking about it a lot. And, yeah, this may be the only picture that that mother has of her little girl. This little girl was about seven when the Gulf War started. How is she, or any one of the 700,000 children under five, according to UN numbers, that have died, how do they have anything to do with what the U.S. wants, besides just being innocent victims? I did send a picture with somebody who's going to Basra, and I hope it gets there. I hope it gets there, because I can't imagine this woman not having a picture of her daughter who had advanced leukemia in, in November. You know, one thing that we think about here in the U.S., when a lot of people don't understand what it means to be bombed, think about that one bomb in Oklahoma City. One bomb. The pain and the anguish that it caused. The destruction of that building. We're talking about thousands of bombs going into downtown Baghdad. That's a city of four million people. Cohen got on the, it was uh, in the New York Times saying, it's going to be a dirty war, there's going to be <coughs> civilian casualties. Well, are we ready to accept that? Oh. No, no way. We are not ready to accept that for any reason, not control of the oil, not control of the region, no reason whatsoever. I'm going to wrap up, but you know what I want to, people to watch out for? In the next few days, what we might see is some outrageous charge the U.S. finds some terrible, terrible thing that the Iraqis have done. Or some explosion somewhere. The U.S. doesn't care how they start a war. Remember the Maine? They sunk the Maine. Remember the Gulf of Tonkin? Never happened. They started a war with it anyway. There will be some kind of outrageous charge that will mean we're all supposed to rally behind the troops and go to war. We've got seven days to build the 28th, and I hope that everyone here can become an organizer to bring people out. We need to have a massive march. We need to shake it up. 
And that's what we intend to do. The people of Iraq deserve a mass march, and they deserve so much more. The only thing that's going to stop the suffering in Iraq is the total lifting of the sanctions and no bombing. I'm going to end the way that they did in Columbus. One, two, three, four, we don't want your racist war. One, two, three, four, we don't want your racist war. One, two, three, four, we don't want your racist war. One, two, three, four, Okay, I've been asked to repeat, uh, if there are any of the small group facilitators who are still in the room, if you would please go uh, out to the hallway. Uh, I need also to say that Deirdre uh, brought a video uh, from Made in Iraq with her, and uh, in the period from uh, 2.30 to uh, 3.45, there will be an opportunity to see that. It's on your, uh, on your schedule. Now, one other announcement, uh, that there's a, the students at BU are organizing. There's a teaching there on, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, days of action on Wednesday, fast for peace, and so on and so forth. I hope they have more of these uh, flyers around. Okay, now I'm going to have to ask Lou to be tough with me uh, in terms of the time as, uh, as I give my talk. I uh, put it into writing to try to uh, move through it quickly. My focus is to place the current crisis in the context of U.S. efforts to maintain its global hegemony. But former National Security Advisor and Trilateral Commission Director Big New Brzezinski terms in his new book, The Global Chessboard, which I recommend you read, The U.S. Empire, which he places in the tradition of Genghis Khan, Greece, Rome, and the British Empire. You might say that the theme of my talk is denial ain't a river in Egypt. Let me, let me begin on a personal note. I, uh, I went to school with Bill Clinton as an undergraduate, and I've watched his uh, career and his corruption uh, from a distance uh, with a kind of philosophical lens. I've also spent a lot of time in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki. And when I saw Bill Clinton's State of the Union speech, and when he came to the uh, point where he said that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction and they've used them, therefore we must bomb Iraq, a kind of classical Georgetown syllogism, I found a uh, visceral anger rising in me. I thought of the victims of Hiroshima, of Nagasaki, of Vietnam, of Iraq during the last war, a war which left biological time bombs as a result of the destruction of the Iraqi infrastructure, with hundreds of thousands of people dying as a result of cholera, gastroenteritis, and other diseases documented by the United Nations, documented by the Harvard School of Public Health. And I thought of how many times the United States has used its nuclear arsenal and threatened to use it. As Howard said, that we live in the heart, not of a repeat offender, it's worse than that. You know, by the standards of the World Court Advisory Opinion a year and a half ago, the United States is a repeated offender of crimes against humanity. Now, I want to be, I want to be clear that I actually, uh, I value uh, international inspection regimes for arms control. I think that if we're going to abolish nuclear weapons, which I think we must, we're going to have to have structures that allow for inspection. Uh, but as we're hearing from the rest of the members of the Security Council in the United Nations, uh, we don't need to bomb in order to inspect. In fact, if we bomb, we lose the ability to inspect. <coughs> We also know, as Howard said, that uh, Saddam Hussein is hardly the first dictator or ally of the United States, dictator ally of the United States, to run afoul of our national security advisors. Think of Mobutu in Zaire, Marcos in the Philippines, Noriega in Panama, GM in Vietnam, just to name a few. Nor is Iraq the only nation that has used or prepared for chemical and biological warfare. My wife's uncle spent his entire career at Dugway Proving Grounds inventing newer and deadlier ways to kill people with biological weapons. Russia today has still a large arsenal of biological weapons. Maybe, maybe the United Nations should be in, in, invading the United States or Russia. You know, same logic. 
It is, as we know, because uh, Saddam Hussein is seen by the management of the uh, U.S. empire, U.S. global hegemony, as a wild card in the uh, oil-rich uh, Middle East, an area that Maxwell Taylor called the, jug the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, called the jugular vein of Western capitalist capitalism, or what Ekbal Ahmed termed the geopolitical center of the struggle for world power. Noam Chomsky, who teaches here, has taught that the axiom number one of U.S. foreign policy since the end of World War II is that neither the Soviet Union, read Russia today, nor U.S. allies gain independent access to the oil of the Middle East. In the industrial era, this is having our throat, our hand on the, on the jugular vein uh, of our allies. We don't need that Middle East oil, we're hardly using any, but Western Europe's entirely dependent on it, except for France and its nuclear, its nuclear power plants. And East Asia, Japan, Korea, China, their economies run on Middle East oil. What I want to do is uh, to say a little bit about uh, US, uh, US doctrines. Uh, my purpose here is not to be theoretical, uh, but to look at the system uh, which the United States has estimated, I'm sorry, the United Nations has estimated, has killed between 600,000 and a million Iraqi civilians uh, as a result of the damage of the war six years ago uh, and the sanctions. What the United States is planning is very much in the tradition of what the United States did to North Korea during the Korean War. It left nothing standing. Samuel Huntington, who holds a prestigious position at the institution at the other end of Massachusetts Avenue, and whose association with the murderous Phoenix operation during the v Vietnam War qualifies him as a war criminal, is now widely known for his doctrinal work, The Clash of Civilizations. One of the theses, uh, the basic thesis in there, accords very well with the uh, thinking of Carol Quigley, who was the most influential uh, professor uh, that Bill Clinton had as an undergraduate student. He made reference to him even in his uh, acceptance speech of the Democratic nomination. Huntington writes in The Clash that, quote, the West won the world not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion, but rather by its superiority in applying organized violence. And the United States has succeeded Britain as the nation with the greatest superiority uh, in applying organized violence. In three minutes, wonderful. Uh, I'm going to look at a little bit of this. Which brings me to uh, another person here at MIT, uh, the former provost and recently retired CIA director, uh, John Deutsch. He gave a speech here in the middle of October uh, in which he said four points. Uh, one, we live in a trident world. Note that only the United States and Britain have trident submarines with their D-5 missiles. Each trident is designed to fire 24 of these missiles, armed with each missile armed with 100 kiloton or more uh, nuclear warheads for a total of 192 hydrogen bombs, each far more destructive uh, the, the Hiroshima or Nagasaki bombs. Uh, the question, the reality is that the rest of the world has lived as a hostage of U.S. military terror. Second, he said that U.S. nuclear policy remains essentially that which was articulated by Henry Kissinger 40 years ago. A policy that brought us Nixon's madman nuclear threats during the 19, 1969 during the Vietnam War and other nuclear threats in 1956, 58, 62, 67, 70, 73, 80, 81, 91, 96. I'm going to go into details during my book outside. Anyhow, he, uh, Deutsch reaffirmed the importance of nuclear weapons, nuclear threats in maintaining U.S. global power. And perhaps most shocking of all, as some in this room will remember, he was utterly clear that the U.S. never intended, nor does it intend now, to implement Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, first negotiated in 1968 and uh, indefinitely extended in 1995. Article 6 lies at the heart of one of the central deals of the 20th century, whereby the declared nuclear powers agreed to completely eliminate their nuclear arsenals in exchange for the non-nuclear powers not obtaining nuclear weapons. It's a fundamental deal. If Saddam Hussein won't honor commitments to the United Nations, that's a problem. 
But if the United States doesn't honor its obligations to the United Nations and the rest of the world, that's a much bigger problem. Two more points. First, I want to uh, quote uh, Joseph Rotblatt, the 1995 um, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, the one senior scientist in the Manhattan Project which developed the atomic bomb, who quit when it was learned that Germany wasn't going to obtain a nuclear weapon. In 1991, when I first met him in Hiroshima, he said this, the choice before us is utterly stark. We can have either global proliferation or complete elimination of nuclear weapons. We don't have any other choice. As long as there is a discriminatory structure of power, people and nations will not tolerate it. And they will seek to equalize either through nuclear weapons or the poor man's nuclear weapons of chemical and biological weapons. The last thing I want to say as I am disciplined by time here is that there have been a succession of U.S. strategic policies for the post-Cold War period beginning with discriminant deterrence in 1987, following through Bush and Clinton. Central to US, the U.S. effort to maintain its, its global empire, uh, right there in discriminant deterrence designed by Kissinger, by Brzezinski, by the who's who of the American elite, they said we can't control everything that's happening in the world. We have to control three places. The Persian Gulf, because of the control of the oil, the Mediterranean for control of Europe, and Asia Pacific, of the Pacific for control of the Asia Pacific. The last thing I want to do in closing is to read from Ignacio Solani, if I haven't lost my place here, uh, who uh, was a man who resisted uh, the fascists and militarism uh, in, uh, in Italy. In his book, uh, Bread and Wine, he writes, even in the land of propaganda, a man, any man, any little man, who goes on thinking with his own head imperils public order. Tons of printed paper repeat the government's slogan. Thousands of loudspeakers, hundreds of thousands of manifestos and leaflets, legions of orators in the squares and at the crossroads. Thousands of priests from the pulpit repeat the slogans ad nauseum to the point of, of collective stupefaction. But it is enough for one little man or woman to say no, to murmur no in his neighbor's ear, or write no on the wall at night and public order is endangered. That, my friends, is our responsibility. The next thing I want to do is, um, is to say, you know, that those of us with gray hair, we've got a real responsibility, which is to move to the side of the stage. Uh, our responsibility is to be helping to empower, to educate younger people so that they can assume responsibility. Real change and the risks that it takes for real change often come from younger people. And I'm happy to uh, welcome to the podium uh, Elena Tate from Cambridge Ridge and Latin High School. My name is Elena Tate. I go to Cambridge Regional Latin High School. Um, I'm also a member of the Young Socialists and the Emergency Committee Against War with Iraq. And I would like to open with a salute to the noble hecklers at Ohio State University. <laughs> and to all of those here that I see who, who have been to demonstrations and to the many around the country and around the world in Turkey and, and Israel who have also been out there and demonstrating. Um, Vocal and visible demonstrations are very important, even if small, because even though we cannot stop a war that they are, you know, if they have decided to do it, they're going to do it. But it shows that there is not monolithic support for U.S. military action. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk briefly about why our framework of opposition to this war must be in a framework of um, opposition to U.S. intervention. Um, <clears throat> let's start by simply stating, the U.S. government is preparing to go to war and this war is going to be horrible. A look at the last time this happened is very important. It has been said that the smart bombs of 1990-91 failed their IQ tests. Um, the 35, in 35% of cases, it took over six bombs to reach targets. Um, the weapon of choice was the B-52 bomber, which dropped one-third of the war's 88,500 tons of bombs in Vietnam-style carpet raids. Um, one Air Force officer called the war a turkey shoot. Um, others refer to it as a cockroach hunt. 
a veteran sergeant of the last war in Iraq on his way down again said he wasn't nervous at all because, lifting up his arms, he said, most of the Iraqis we saw were like this. Um, after the war, General Colin Powell was asked for an estimate of the number of Iraqis killed. Powell replied, it's not really a number that I'm terribly interested in. This past week in Ohio, when Secretary of State, the Secretary of State was asked to estimate the number of innocent Iraqis who would be killed as a result of the bombardment, replied, let me just say, I'm willing to make a bet to anyone here that we care about the people of Iraq more than Saddam Hussein does. And if he does the totally uncivilized thing of putting women and children to guard his regime, then their fault is his. So the bombs would just fall on their heads and it's not the U.S. fault. Um, I think it is a vital starting point in opposition of this war to recognize and respect the sovereignty of nations. The U.S. government is the biggest defender of sovereignty in the world and has proved itself to be the biggest threat to its neighbors. Um, look at invasions and occupations, the Bay of Pigs, Grenada, Panama, the funding of dirt, dirty wars and dictators, the Contras, Pinochet, Suharto, the maintaining of sanctions, themselves weapons of mass destruction, Iraq, Cuba, and the colony of 100 years, Puerto Rico. We must see that the U.S. led weapons inspectors for their audacity and arrogance. What gives the Pentagon the right to dictate what anyone else can have in their arsenals? I think one's moral duty disappears after using napalm, Agent Orange, depleted uranium, and atomic bombs. <clears throat> we, must, we must reject the idea, as Madeleine Alba and Clinton have laid out, that the United States of America is the world's indispensable nation, that it is the international peacekeeper slash police force. We must reject the manifest destiny rationale that has not ebbed for a moment in U.S. foreign policy. The whole world is not the property of U.S. rulers. The Middle East is not their backyard, nor is the Caribbean, nor the entire Third World. Respect for sovereignty must be our starting point, or else we open ourselves to all kinds of rationalizations to go to war. We must wholeheartedly reject the notion that U.S. intervention is in the best interest of the people in whose countries it is intervening. Just as we must reject the idea that the U.S. intervenes in the best interest of the majority of people here in this country. We must be very clear, the U.S. government represents and protects its own economic and geopolitical interests around the world, um, and the interests of the tiny minority of people who own the majority of the world's resources and wealth. They are going to war for oil, for control in the Middle East, and to show the world who exactly is in charge. When Madeleine K. Albright said to the rowdy heckler who questioned her about inconsistencies in U.S. foreign policy, she said, Saddam Hussein is qualitatively and quantitatively different from every brutal dictator that has appeared recently. What she means is all the rest have been backed by the U.S. <laughs> we must expose the fact that the U.S. government does not care one bit about the people of Iraq and that they just want a subservient regime in Baghdad. The oppressed people of Iraq are the only ones who with the ability and the power to create a leadership that they want to govern them. You cannot implement a democracy from the outside. And so we stand with the people of Iraq in demanding, U.S. hands off Iraq, troops out of the Middle East now, no bombing, lift the sanctions. Um, there will be pressure after any bombing to unite. We must keep our steadfast and uncompromising position against Washington's brutal war against the people of Iraq. Um, so I urge all of you conti to continue studying and discussing this coming war with classmates and coworkers, and get involved with upcoming events organized by the Emergency Committee Against War with Iraq. Thank you. I'm Mark Brzezinski, your host for this weekly program, Mideast Realities, and thank you for watching. If you too are concerned about the situation in today's Middle East and about U.S. policies toward that crucial region of the world, and if you'd like to meet like-minded persons, why don't you come to one of our weekly social meetings? I'll be there, of course. Just give us a call for details.